I tell people, if you want to run a 5K, you probably don't need a coach. If you want to win the 5K, you absolutely need a coach. If you want to run a tough mutter, you probably don't need a coach. If you want to set a PR in your next tough mutter, you probably need a coach. So it's a question of aspiration, you know, and where you seek to gain advantage and improve on yourself and your business and how how you surround yourself with the right tools matters in terms of how long it takes and whether or not you can get there is not usually a question for most entrepreneurs. It's how long will it take and how much pain will I endure? That's the, I think the last <laughs> thing is like, man, sometimes you just need help to get off the struggle bus, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes, yep. we, we as entrepreneurs, like that's part of the adrenaline that we get, but it doesn't have to be as painful. Welcome back, Solar Warriors. This is Tactical Tuesday, practical guidance to get you into a place of building your career, your business with the tools that you need, discerning what products you use or what frameworks help you build the team and the business that is going to take your idea out in the world. We are on the front lines of the clean energy transition. And as a leader, you need to equip yourself. That's what Tactical Tuesday is all about. I honor you for taking the only non-renewable resource you've got and investing it here, and that is your time. I promise that we are gonna give you a great return for it. If you had a moment to listen, if you are subscribed to the show and you queued it up, the interview several months ago with Bob and Maria Kingery here in North Carolina, some local solar legends was one that fascinated me for a number of reasons. And I tabled at the time a conversation with Maria about how she has evolved beyond Southern Energy Management, the business that she and Bob have built for the last 20 plus years into coaching. And I know that many of you have both used and loved coaching. Others have avoided and um, perhaps even besmirched it. Um, And several more are just curious and have certainly considered somewhere in the back of your mind. Would I need coaching at what point? We're going to talk about that today. My friend Maria Kingery has a couple of decades of business building experience. And in fact, the last five plus years, she's been an EOS implementer. You're probably familiar with EOS from books like Rocket Fuel and Traction from Gino Wickman. But there are more frameworks and Maria has explored many of them. The evolution of her coaching practice is why I wanted to have Maria here on the show to dig in with me and help you get a little more clarity about whether or not coaching is right for you, but also what are the tools that help to serve the framework, the foundation for a thriving business and how do coaches help to get you along the path. Drawing from her experience as the co-founder and chief impact officer of Southern Energy Management, Maria has helped dozens of other business leaders exactly this way. And she's helped guide Southern Energy Management, a B Corp, into a successful and thriving solar company here in North Carolina. So you're in good hands. And if you like conversations like this with leaders on the front lines of the energy transition, well, I hope that you will tune in for more episodes and that you'll subscribe to the show because we have them twice weekly tactical, practical advice, just like today's episode and long form executive profiles, like the one we did with the Kingeries a few months ago. But for now, let's get ready to tune up your skills, Solar Warrior, as we tune into another practical, tactical advice filled session here on Suncast. Well, Maria, it is so good to see you again, uh, even though uh, it may sound strange for folks that we both live within uh, 20 minutes of one another. We don't get a chance to really hang out that much. Welcome to Suncast. Thank you, Nico. It's good to be with you again. I really got a sense in the conversations that we had leading up to the interview with you and Bob that there are perhaps dozens of companies who have leaned in to your guidance and counseling to help them either move past specific roadblocks, unlock uh, sort of organizational uh, capacity, or just make critical path decisions that they perhaps another wouldn't have been able to accomplish in other ways. And so I wanted to talk today about the concept at a high level of coaching, but also the frameworks and some of the practical advice that businesses, not even advice, some of the practical guidance that comes from 
having an outside viewpoint on the business. From the outset, I think a lot of folks ask the question at some point in their entrepreneurial career, do I need a coach? Why would I need a coach? Or they just lambast it because that's for, you know, those weak folks who who can't get shit done. Um, <laughs> Kim, let's just hit that out of the gate. From your perspective, what's the value of having an, a counselor, a coach, a guide like yourself uh, for a business owner? There are many, Nico. And I will say... One of my clients gave me the best, like, zinger phrase that uh, I think describes it perfectly. And she said, you can't read the label from inside the jar. You know, we were the same at Southern Energy Management. I mean, mm-hmm. the reason that I evolved and, and became a coach was because of the value that we got from it. And the value came from having somebody who was not – didn't have a a self-interest in the success of the organization. I wasn't getting a paycheck. Of course, they were being compensated, but who could tell us the things that we had not been able to, or in some cases refused to see. Mm -hmm. Uh, I can remember several times. And now, of course, I've had these experiences with my own clients where it's like, there's the thing that you know you need to do. Mm -hmm but you're just not doing it Mm -hmm. and having someone who can, you know, just like executive coaching, any type of coaching, having someone hold up that mirror and Mm -hmm. say, Hey, you know, do you see this? There's two things that resonate for me there. One, I'll go in reverse order. Great questions. The folks that I know who are coaches in an intuitive way have learned to ask good questions and do sense, have a sense for intuiting what is the right next question because each one is levers that can move someone in a particular direction it's a um it's a it's a divert a way to move into and out of a conversation in in gentle or sometimes abrupt ways Mm -hmm. but the other is the mirror and when i talk to coaching clients or prospects folks that have reached out and asked if i can sort of help them get clarity on one topic or another i use the mirror analogy similar to the label but i say Uh, You know, if you are going to, very few guys I know shave without a mirror, even though you know your face. And especially if, like me, you have an actual structured beard rather than just a clean shaven face, you need a mirror. You need to know, did I get the line right? (laughs) Am I shaping this in the way that is going to be pleasing to me and then to others? And I, as a coach, am that mirror, right? I I don't try to tell them what their beard should look like. I try to help them see their beard for what it is and sculpt it in the way that they've told me that they imagine it could look, right? Yeah. Just to build on your analogy, Nico, I was just, you know, there are different styles of beards, right? I mean, you know, they're, everybody's going to have their own unique style because of their face, right? Mm -hmm. Um, However, talking with someone or looking at a photograph or, you know, having someone to teach you Mm -hmm. how to manage and how to get the result that you want. Right. Maybe the other thing that comes to me is like when you do something repeatedly over time, you start to see patterns. Yeah. Right. And so in, in what we do for a living, right. You start to see patterns of uh, behaviors, patterns of uh, the same sort of issues arise yeah. that folks are dealing with. And so that's where a coach can really, you know, share experience. Yeah, I concur in that. Um, I can't even, I can't put into to qualification terms the number of times that either from a podcast episode where I've off, off, uh, sort of offline, gotten to go deep with a founder or in another coaching session, I've been able to bring examples, experiences from where I've seen something that looked similar. It, If you think about it, the way we used to all go to the, I, I at least go to barbershop and I would sit waiting for a haircut, I'd look through the magazine, right? At all the different examples of hairstyles. Well, the person sitting in the, in the, in the barber, um, position, right? Not the barber chair, but the person, the stylist doesn't have to look at that magazine. They've seen thousands of heads. They know 
they even they even can remember if you come in frequently enough exactly the contours of your hair and mm-hmm. and what it is that you are looking for and if you come to them and say what's going to look good on me they can give you advice but in the same way this came to me when you were talking about that and i didn't know i didn't i didn't i didn't imagine we'd spend um, more than three or four minutes on this but i think this is really important because one of the questions that we may want to wrap with at the end of this conversation is how do i actually select a coach if i if i want to go down this path and for me it's a very individual personal choice in the same way some people go to supercuts because they don't care yeah right i go to a place called rocks barbershop and rocks here in durham is the place for beards and beard trims and so much so that the logo is a man's beard right, right? there's another place called called um pedro's that their uh their um, tagline is guaranteed shorter hair Right. Well, I don't need I don't need shorter hair. I want good looking hair. Um, so I trust the folks at Rocks and I pay more for it. I probably uh, I pay a premium. We'll just say that. Yeah. So there's a, there is a personal selection process that is hard to paint in broad strokes. But what is easier to paint in broad spro- strokes are the fundamentals of how businesses work. And so what, what brought this conversation up for you and I is that I get a lot of folks in the interview process who, when they, when I ask them, you know, were there any fundamental building blocks or more books that you refer to traction and rocket fuel over and over come up? And those, if you're not familiar as a listener, are the books written by Gino Wickman that are a part of uh, an entire canon of books around what they've dubbed EOS or the Entrepreneur Operating System. Maria, you have been an implementer for five plus years as an uh, as an EOS certified coach. Can you talk about the various frameworks and the value to the entrepreneur that exist that, that coaches often lean on, like being an EOS implementer, to help a entrepreneur that has a great idea, probably a growing business, and they're trying to figure out how to corral the work or the objectives or some piece of the business just feels off and they're looking for support. Can you just kind of take us into that place where EOS and and other frameworks exist? Sure. Um, But I do need to clarify, Nico, because I'm not an EOS implementer currently. Okay. Yeah, I'm not. I left the EOS implementer community and gosh, I think it was 2020. So, oh, wow. Yeah. Okay, I didn't realize it was that far back. Yeah. yeah. So it's been a number of years that mm-hmm. I've been, and then I joined another group, uh, mm-hmm. but now I'm delightfully independent other than I do have a peer group of around a dozen other women who do yeah. similar work uh, to what I do. So I think the reason that traction and rocket fuel and the whole EOS concept has been so powerful is because they really nail the fundamentals of what it takes to run a great business, right? So they talk about meeting structures. They talk Mm -hmm. about accountability. They talk about KPIs um, and, and, and vision. And they do it in a way, you know, they talk about six key components. Well, that's really simple. Right. Mm-hmm. And and everybody can sort of wrap their heads around it. And and it's it's been distilled. I mean, I think Gino Whitman is a genius because he, yeah. basically what he did was he distilled, you know, thousands maybe of of business books, right? There's tons of them out. There's tons of other operating systems out there, but he distilled it down to what was really fundamental, like the gotta haves, the necessary, like if you're gonna run a great business, you gotta have these things. You know, the reason that I'm no longer an AOS implementer is because it's a very, um, it's very structured. It's very specific, um, how it runs. What I found with the clients that I work with, who I think we probably share a lot of the similar type of clients, um, many of them outright resisted being put mm-hmm. into a box. Right. And so they wanted to name their meetings different things. They wanted to, they just, they wanted to have their own custom flavor of an operating system. Um, there are a ton of them out there, right? They're scaling up. There's, um, 
great game of business has a basically a type of operating system. There's e myth. There's there's so many, right? Yeah. But the fundamental concept that you have to have, you know, what I tell people is. You, just like your phone has an operating system that operates in the background, yeah. your business needs to have that too. Yeah, because it tells, it, it ensures, as I say, my operations manager ensures the trains run on time, right. right? But something's got to, someone has to, something, some system has to come up with that schedule, with the algorithm, with the protocols, the processes by which everyone else can make decisions. That's and right. Everyone, yeah, you, it's it's a framework. I mean, you just like you can think of it as the scaffolding of mm-hmm. your organization, right? That yeah. we can we can all operate together. I would encourage folks to uh, read books like Traction and Rocket Fuel and Scaling Up by Vern Harnish. <clears throat> We've recommended all of those numerous times here on the podcast. I have actually found a number of entrepreneurs who can read those books and just go to work. They're, they're architects and visionaries to, to use some EOS terms. But why then do so many folks fall in the category of, well, I've read the book and I'm still not doing it. I'm not creating the meetings. And how can, how can a coach like yourself help them get, uh, get through that process? Is it more than just accountability? Are there, uh, you know, is, is there specific clarity that needs to be found beyond just what the book can teach? Absolutely. I mean, what's coming to me, Nico, is going back to your beard reference, right? I can watch a YouTube video or read a book on how to have a great beard. It doesn't mean that I can actually do it. I need someone to teach me. I need someone to guide me along Mm. and uh, help me because there there are nuances, right? Yeah. And each... um, each bring it back to business. Every business is unique, yeah. right? So, and I, I really don't believe that there is. I, I did believe this for quite some time. Again, I don't believe there's a one size fits all approach. And I used to be like, really, no, you have to run your meetings in exactly this way. And oh yeah, you know, and it's very prescriptive. Yeah, maybe you need a way to run meetings because your meetings are terrible right now. And if so, we can talk about that, but maybe your meetings are doing just fine and you need to bring in some other elements. Maybe it's how, what you're talking about in those meetings. For example, I read something recently. I wish I could remember what it, where it came from. Mm -hmm. Uh, But they were talking about like the, the landscape Right, so you need to understand the land. Each each individual uh, business has its own landscape that it's operating in. Yeah, and particularly like within the solar industry, there is like a a, a constant in the solar industry is policy change. Mm-hmm. And so, someone who understands that landscape and understands the implications of, we're going to need to adjust our plan as we go. And we need to be very realistic about, yes, we can have a 10-year vision and also recognize that something outside anything that we've imagined yet could come in and change the game for us. Yeah. So being able to maintain that flexibility and again, particularly in the solar industry, I think is yeah. so important. And having an outside agent, so to speak, does it helps to get that um, uh, the un the unbiased objective viewpoint. Yeah, uh, I find that a lot of folks I work with they prefer, and it's a part of our agreements that I'm not going to agree with them. Yeah. They they actually in many ways hope that I don't agree with them. Yeah, <laughs> that I can be a voice of of reason, and in some cases I have been. Uh, and I'm certain that you have as well. You know, there's uh, there are some real fundamental building blocks that a lot of us as entrepreneurs uh, forego in the early stages. I'm really impressed, in fact, when I see a business that is one or two years old and really has already written down their vision and their values. And they've tried to define the culture of the business before they have three, four, five, even 10 employees, right? The importance of the core concept of core values I'd like to explore with you because 
I find often when a business is growing faster than they uh, are able to manage, it can come down to a few things and core values is one of them Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the stumbling blocks. Can you help unpack a bit how core values can be a great uh, building block, how to guide a founder through the process of establishing those core values and, and then how they can be a tool for behavior uh, regulation and, and agreements inside the company. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for asking about that. It's probably my favorite topic because I think that core values are often misunderstood, right? And they're often, there's a, there's a couple of things that when I, when I work with clients, I ask them to think of behaviors that they want to uh, that they want to see more of in the organization. And I always have them make core values. Like you see core values on, on the wall, integrity, like invariably I'll walk into a client and they'll have things, you know, integrity, trust, uh, safety, you know, I mean, which are all things that are important and things that we value, yeah. but I don't really know what I'm supposed to do with that. Mm-hmm. So I always guide clients to have to activate their core values and make sure that they have verbs, right? Mm-hmm. So seek solutions, for example, as opposed to collaboration uh, mm-hmm. is an example. And, and once you have these fundamental behavior-based core values in place, then it makes the relationships inside the organization go much smoother because we all know what's expected of us in terms of how we're going to, not just what we're going to do. What we do is very important, but the thing that keeps companies from reaching their full potential, I believe, is not, we can always change what we do. It's how we're being together and how we are, how we operate as a team and how we solve problems together that really makes a difference. And core values are, are a guidepost, right? So yeah. you seek solutions as an example, right? When when that's one of that's SEM's first core value. Yeah. And when we hire someone, we ask questions around tell me about a time when you ran into, you know, an an issue and you had to solve a problem you didn't there wasn't an SOP for it what did you do yeah. Yeah. and so we ask behavior based questions and then you know the other thing is when things go sideways a little bit as they yeah. sometimes can with people can lean back on those core values yeah i had uh, a great example of that with a client who had gotten serious finally about their core values and the entire team, especially the leadership team, had agreed upon them. And they had a foreman in the field, a young guy who had been given a lot of responsibility and trust. And they really wanted to keep him on board. But the CEO was having a hard time giving him critical feedback about the behavior, how he was being as a leader in the field to the other young folks in the crew. And I said, well, I I understand that you've got this core value that they're not aligned with and that that core value is an agreement on the team. And he took a step back and he said, whoa, actually you're right. This isn't me personally judging this guy. It is us collectively looking at the objective reality that he's not in alignment with a core value. We've all said that we're going to adhere to. Right. And the freedom that gave him as the founder and CEO and that gives his operators to be able to manage expectations on the team is tremendous. And I think that that's a, it's, a, it's a missed opportunity for most companies that dismiss values and core values as kind of intangible yeah. sort of things that people do when they're wasting time not doing real business. <laughs> it's the fluffy stuff, right? Yeah. Uh, it, it actually, I would argue that clearly articulated core values and a clearly articulated very simple purpose yeah are are the two things that every business mm-hmm. needs to have from from day 1 i mean they can they can evolve mm-hmm. over time 
SEM for years had uh, Innovate for Impact was our I. We, we, our core value spell the word shine, which is kind of cutesy yeah. and whatever. <laughs> but, but I tell you, it helps people remember. It does. It really does. But I was Innovate for Impact. And at one of our quarterly or annual planning sessions, one of our team members said, you know, I don't think this suits us anymore. Hmm. And so we ended up changing it to invest in the greater good, which has a lot of different uh, connotations. But one of them is just like you're saying, Nico, what this team lead was saying he needed was a way to have a conversation with a team member who wasn't like collaborating and seeking solutions. And it mm. was really more about me over we. Um, yeah. He needed a way to talk about that. And the rest of the 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 guy that we call it the guidance team at SEM, the rest of our mm. team agreed, and so uh, it changed. So they're not, you know. And I always tell my clients this: it's not their their core to who you are, and their agreements mm. about behaviors. Yeah, of how you're going to be together as the mm -hmm. business evolves maybe something's missing. Maybe you need to change it. Like you should always revisit them and make sure again that that alignment totally. with how we want to be is still being articulated. Yeah. And I appreciate that you also gave the example a few moments ago of how to integrate core values into behavior-based questions that allow you to filter for the right people at the beginning of the process. Arguably the most important part of building a business is the hiring and getting that team aligned around those core values, as you rightly said, around those agreements so that someone can self-select that they are not willing to line up for those agreements, but also so that your team knows how to, to give a fair judgment around whether or not a potential candidate seems like a good cultural fit. And you have to have that barometer. You have to have that yardstick, so to speak, of the culture and the core values uh, help to establish that. You and I talked a, a bit about the different frameworks. One of the ones that I know you ad, um, you appreciate, even if it's not um, sort of at every turn, uh, all 15 of them, you have integrated the 15 commitments. And I sort of look at that, whereas EOS is tactical, sort of meetings and KPIs, 15 commitments sort of helps to, to define certain behavioral and cultural norms that um, that a company can align around. And one of those that's a core piece of it is this concept of the drama triangle. So I'd like for you to help uh, in the in the waning moments of our conversation here. I'd love for you to help explain the process of creating a drama free workplace. <laughs> well, first you get you get those agreements set first, you know, yeah. what did someone core values? Yeah, what did what did I hear once? Uh Unclear expectations are a down payment for future resentment. Oh my God, uh, that's good. So that's good. So that's uh, that's my pitch for clear core values. Um, you know, the fifteen commitments is really ultimately about creating a drama-free workplace. I see those things as synonymous because mm -hmm. it's about like moving from uh, victim, hero, bully. Uh, mm -hmm. Hartman's drama triangle. Uh, he was a psychologist in the 60s, I believe, who worked with dysfunctional relationships. And he found people were playing these three roles, one of these three roles, and sometimes all of them within the same interaction. Uh, we could have a whole new, a whole thing about that. But then there's a, but then there's the inverse of it, which is a shift. And 15 Commitments does the best job that I've ever seen of articulating this. There's a line. And you shift from being victim, hero, bully to being a challenger, coach, and co-creator. Well, they say creator. I refer to mm -hmm. it as co-creator. Co yeah. Because really, that's where, as an organization, that's where we want to be. We want to challenge each other. We want to coach and, and lead and help each other to grow so that we can co-create the future and the results that we agree on that we want mm -hmm. to, to create. And again, just 
uh, this concept of if people can get that there is a shift from victim, and it's really from victim to to co-creator. That's the fundamental shift, right? Things are happening to me and to us. And, you know, mm. I, the whole solar coaster thing, don't get me started on that. But I, I've tried to ban it because I think it's victim language. It's like we're, we're at, at any rate, won't go too deep into that. But Instead, like, what what does it look like when we're powerful co-creators? It's one of the reasons I really appreciate the language that you use. Um, as I, I got a little, you know, solar warrior still makes me a little uncomfortable, but that's my own stuff. But it, but it is about like we're we're co-creating this this transition and this future. Yeah, and and that is that's above the line language. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're not alone, by the way, I've been told. Um, I appreciate that you acknowledge that that's uh, something that you are, that that is an internal conflict for you, the solar warrior concept, because it is something that I've been, I've had only, only women, honestly, have yeah. said that they, that they struggle with it. And I'm, uh, I'm okay with it because I have, um, you know, a, a, in creating a brand, part of creating a community or a tribe, which I have yeah. to be sensitive around, certainly in, um, in the way that it is described mm -hmm. um, is giving a common vernacular. And there's a ton of folks that come up to me and they'll say, I'm a solar warrior, man. I love the, uh, and they love the moniker. So, um, well, and I'll, I'll just say my number one core value personally, and for my, is stay curious and for my business as well. Like being yeah. a coach that's required. We have to stay curious. I'm really curious about my response to it. And, and maybe we, Maybe that's maybe I do need to have more of a warrior mentality. So I'll I'll take that away from this conversation and yeah yeah. I think um, I've never tried to enunciate it, but I believe that the concept around solar warrior for me is that a warrior is courageous, mm -hmm. and I think that we don't appreciate that in context of history a warrior routinely left home not ne never knowing if they would come back yeah absolutely and I, I think those of us who have been around this industry for a while uh you know for me it was 2001 yeah. uh yeah. i've certainly had to on multiple occasions dig down to connect with that inner warrior yeah yeah, I mean, we really are in a fight for the, um, for for what is truth. We're in a fight for uh, how do we preserve the kind of planet that we want to pass on to our children, and to really to their children's children, and uh, how do we feel that we are contributing to the legacy either of destroying or preserving that planet. Um, and I, and I do think that there are those who sit on the sidelines and they believe they're neither do they're neither destroying nor preserving and they're okay with that. Um, most of the people I know in the solar industry uh, are not here because they see huge dollar signs. There are a lot of those, but it's because they believe that this is one of the key levers that can unlock our ability to reduce the our impact on on the environment. And uh, you know, getting back to the framework of the drama triangle, uh, you know, I would encourage folks to explore it. I'll link to the 15 commitments and also a, a nice Forbes article around uh, how to transform your relationships through uh, understanding the drama, drama triangle, because the core of not just building out these core values, but of uh, implementing something like EOS um, or traction or, uh, I mean, sorry, or uh, scaling up or any Rockefeller habits, like really picking a, a, a thing that gives you a framework. It is to get clearer to your point on what are those expectations? How do I assure that there's alignment in our, in my organization such that as the owner, I can focus on the things that only I can accomplish and I can trust my team to be going, uh, going all out on the things that we agree are important without me feeling like I needed to micromanage and, you know, just losing sleep over it and knowing that the business can operate ideally if you want to be a business owner, without you <laughs> right yeah um one last question before we wrap assuming someone has had a sense of uh of a, a spark today 
the, I know they're asking the question, well, how, how do I go about picking a coach? Do you have a few words of wisdom there? I would say that core values fit is relevant there as well. Right. And like the mm-hmm. making sure like the right coach for your business is somebody who, number one, you trust and resonate with, and you want to make sure that they do have a process that they follow, whether it's one of the, you know, ones that you've named or whether mm-hmm. they have their own process like I do, mm-hmm. right? That they're not just winging it when when they come in. Uh, in this particular, like if they're answering this call to implement, to create their own operating system within their organization. Right. Yeah. And, and then it's, it's really important that you trust the person mm-hmm. and that you get along with them and that you uh, believe that they can help you. Yeah. And, that, and also it's just as important for the coach to want to do the work with yeah, you know, I'm like you just have to. I don't know why this word's coming to me, but you got to vibe with them. <laughs> you know, it's true. I'm not. I'm it's definitely true. not for everybody, Nico. I don't know about you. Yep. Yeah. No. You, uh, there are people who want someone to be along the path with them, and there are others who want a drill sergeant. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing wrong with either of those two. Right. I tell people if you want to run a 5K you probably don't need a coach. If you want to win the 5K, you absolutely need a coach. If you want to run a tough mutter, you probably don't need a coach. If you want to set a PR in your next tough mutter, you probably need a coach. So it's a question of aspiration, you know, and where you seek to gain advantage and improve on yourself and your business and how how you surround yourself with the right tools matters in terms of how long it takes. And whether or not you can get there is not usually a question for most entrepreneurs. It's how long will it take and how much pain will I endure? That's the, I think the last (laughs) thing is like, man, sometimes you just need help to get off the struggle bus, right? (laughs) Mm -hmm. Just we, we, as entrepreneurs, like that's part of the adrenaline that we get, but it doesn't have to be as painful. Maria, I am grateful for uh, folks like you who package the business experience of two decades into a a consulting practice in a way that is heart-led and that allows entrepreneurs to tap into that knowledge without having to go through the experience painfully themselves and and feel like they're on an island, which is the most common retort of most uh, of most successful entrepreneurs that it's lonely yeah. uh, at the top, proverbially speaking. So thank you for uh, being courageous to to do this. Obviously, you've got a business of your own that you guys are running and um, and you could be doing any number of things and speaking from any number of stages. I appreciate you taking the time to come to Suncast to help share this message. If folks are so inclined, how can they get to know you better? How can they connect with you? Yeah, the best way to get me, uh, my email is maria at 360impact.us. Uh, or LinkedIn. You could always reach out on LinkedIn. I'd love to support my my state of purpose in life is to impact the impactors. So mm. your audience is doing really important work. Yeah. Uh, and so if I can help them along their way, I would love to do that. And Nico, I just want to thank you again for what you do and, and the way that you do it. This is our second conversation that we've had. And I just appreciate the spirit that you bring to to this work. So thank you. Thank you. The gratitude is mutual. And uh, I hope that folks will take seriously the deep inner work. I think that we're in a cultural revolution right now where entrepreneurs realize that the grinded out mentality doesn't lead to a fulfilling life. Uh, for most, it certainly does for some. And the the rest of us, Got to figure out, okay, this is actually a marathon. How am I going to survive this marathon? I'm not going to exit in two years or five. How, how do I turn this into something that I never look for an exit because I'm so fulfilled in my work? And I see that you 
help entrepreneurs answer that question. So thank you for spending time with us. And thank you for tuning in uh, either on YouTube or on the podcast. Uh, I hope that you will take this information to heart, that you will convert it uh, from uh, knowledge into wisdom. And the only way to do that is through application. So if you, ha- if you need help with that, please reach out to Maria or myself. There are numerous ways that you can accomplish that. There's certainly link in the description to how you can reach either of us. And I, 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 I want it to be known that I am not asking you to come be my coaching client and neither is Maria. We're asking you to consider that there is value in the, in having someone as a support. And if you'd like to get clarity on that for 15 minutes uh, or 30, uh, there will certainly be ways that we'll link in the description for how you can get that done. In the meantime, thank you for tuning in and thank you, Maria, for helping tune up our solar warriors. Absolutely. Thank you, Nika.